battle. Hallelujah. How many have come to make a joyful noise today? Tell the person next to you, we've come to make a joyful noise for the Lord because he is worthy to be praised. Ephesians chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. If you have your Bible with you, we'd ask if you would turn to Ephesians chapter number four. If you have your iPhone, whatever device you may have to communicate with, we ask that you will turn it on. Turn it on. Go to your selfie. However you take a picture, do a selfie. Right? That's right. Do a selfie and say, I'm at the 4th Street Missionary Baptist Church. 
I wish you were here with us. The pastor is about to give his text and his title. It's all right. Y'all selfie everywhere else. Go ahead, Shaw, go ahead and take a selfie. Tell me at the Fourth Street Missionary Baptist Church, you know. <laughs> the pastor is about to give his text and title. Wish you were here with us. See you next week. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter number four, we're going to focus on verses one through six. Ephesians chapter number four, Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus. Listen to what he says. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. And one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Our text verses will be verses 2 and 3. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in the love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The sermon title I want to use this morning is Have a Team Player Spirit. Have a team player spirit. If I had to do a subtitle, I would subtitle it as have a team player's attitude. Have a team player's attitude. In light of what all we've been seeing throughout this week and throughout the, this year, it is good to be reminded what a team player spirit looks like. Teamwork, my brothers and sisters, is vitally important to any organization. Would you not agree? Think about football players and their success. To be successful, you need the other players on the team to carry out their responsibility. In other words, do their job. Last Christmas, the Dallas Cowboys running back, Ezekiel Elliott, bought these John Deere utility vehicles for this offensive line of the Dallas Cowboys. They cost about $10,000 each. You might have to buy a little bit more this year. I don't know. The most outrageous gift was by a guy most here love, and I do use the operative word, most, Tom Brady. Do we have any Tom Brady fans in the house? If Tom was here, he would be very disappointed. But in 2008, he gave his offensive linemen, listen to what he bought them, an Audi, Q7 SUV valued at $42,000 each. Not too bad. What you not say? There's lots of players who give great gifts, especially after they've had great seasons. The question is, why do they do this? Brady wouldn't be as good as he is without a great offensive line. And Ezekiel Elliott would not have been the great rookie running back without his offensive line blocking well for him. Some of you may remember this date on July 20th, 
1969. When Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, he was the focus of attention for the entire planet. Even today, his name is most associated with the moon voyage. His statement, one small step for man, will never be forgotten. What is forgotten is that the Apollo expedition succeeded because a large and committed team of individuals sacrificed day and night for years to make it happen. Neil Armstrong was only one of over 218,000 people who worked on the Apollo project. He received most of the recognition, yes, but he would be the first to tell you it was a team effort. Remember the Challenger disaster? Remember what the cause of the disaster was? An O-ring. It was a part which didn't cost much. Yet because it didn't work properly, there was a disaster and seven people died. That's the way it is with every area of life, my brothers and sisters. Life is a team effort. God intends for us to work together in order to achieve accomplished goals and fulfill purposes in life. One person cannot do it alone. And sometimes when one person doesn't do what they need to do, we suffer as well. You know, my brothers and sisters, it's the same at the church. Church is a team, community, effort. In order to do the work God has called us to do, we must work together as a community, a team. Too often the strategy is to hire a professional or a group of professionals to do the work of the ministry for the people. Who are the recipients of ministry? That's not the biblical model. The Bible tells us God's method is in Ephesians 4. Do y'all want to take a look at it? Here it is. Verse number 11, Ephesians 4, verse number 11. It says, it was he who gave, he being Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Verse 12 says, for what reason? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. God's plan for sustaining and growing his church involves team work. It involves everyone working together, everyone caring for one another. We make sure the body is cared for and is healthy. This is why Paul reminds us in Romans chapter number 12. And I just want to read verses 9 through 18 because it is so telling in terms of what teamwork really is, 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 is supposed to be like. What we're supposed to, how we're supposed to live. Listen to what Paul writes to the, those believers in Rome. He writes this in verse number nine. He says, first of all, lo let love be genuine. Abhor, that means to hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Here's what he says in verse number 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Verse number 11, he says, do not be slothful. That means do not be lazy in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Then verse number 12, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Then verse number 13 says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Verse number 14 says, bless those who... Who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. 
Number 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Verse 16 says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Here's what verse 18 says. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Now, I only wanted to read one verse to you. And that verse was verse number 15. And it says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That was it. And then I reread the passage. And I realized I could not leave out one word. Because this is so vital. Think about what Paul is really telling us about the way we are to live our lives with one another. And that's the key. That's the key. Don't miss this. The key is living our lives with one another. Listen to what it says in, in paraphrasing. He says, what Paul is really saying, let your love be genuine. Your love should not be filled with phoniness. Fake hypocrisy. Love one another as brothers and sisters. Lead the way in showing love and honor. Don't wait for others to do it. You do it. Be passionate and excited about Christ. Don't be lazy about your faith. Have hope. Be joyful. Even in bad times. Be patient, be prayerful. Contribute to those who have needs. Be hospitable and welcome others. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them out. Turn to the person next to you and say, don't curse them out. Even though they may say something bad about you, don't curse them out. And you find out about it, don't be cussing them out. I was trying to be proper there, curse, but y'all know what I'm talking about, cuss. Don't cuss them out. Tell the person that too, don't cuss them out. And then Paul says, live in unity with one, live in unity with one another. Don't think too much of yourself. And this is where I say to the teens, whether you're from Shaw, whether you're from, you know, Jordan, or whether you're from Carver, whether you're from, you know, Kendrick, or whether you're from Northside, whether you're from um, Spencer, Hardaway, you know, Hardaway, you know, the Hawks, you know, Columbus High School, you know, where, Brookstone, Glenwood, I mean, Central, cross the track. Don't think highly of yourself. If you are a champion, act like a champion. Show respect to the ones you just beat. Is that not a great prescription for community in the church? But also within our schools, within our homes. Is that not the way we are to live our lives with one another in the world? Somebody need to tweet President Trump. Romans. Is there anybody in the house? Somebody need to tweet him Ephesians 4. The church is a team. Tell somebody the church is a team. If you're, if you're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, turn to the person next to you and say, hello, church. It's not the pew you sit on. It's not the carpet you are stepping on. It's not the lights in the ceiling. That's not the church. This is the Lord's house where the church come to praise him. 
Now, if you are not saved, if you have not been rescued from the power of sin, if you have not been rescued from the penalty of sin, if you do not have a changed life in relationship with God, then you cannot say that you are part of his church. You're not a part of his team. In order to succeed as a church and as individuals, we must have a team player spirit. Everybody say we must have a team player spirit. Must have a team player attitude. But you may be asking, how is that so? So in Ephesians chapter number 4, Paul shows us how to have a team player's spirit, a team player's attitude. He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So the question becomes, what does this mean? I want to just take those three words and just ask, what does this mean? Now, this is in the light and this is in the background of without saying, but I'll go ahead and say it, that you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So first of all, Paul said, be what? Be humble. What does that mean? That means having an attitude that says the team is more important than me. Everybody say the team is more important than me. Anybody heard of Coach Lou Holtz? Well, let me just go ahead and give you a Lou Holtz class 101. When Coach Lou Holtz began his coaching career at the University of Minnesota, he gave every player on his team a T-shirt. Printed across the chest in large block letters was the word team. Beneath team in tiny letters was the word me. Coach Holtz told his team, this t-shirt serves to remind you that the team is more important than you are. And you should always Put the team above you. We should ask ourselves an important question, particularly as believers in Jesus Christ. Am I willing to put the team, the church, above me? Am I willing to think of others more than I think about myself am I willing to take a low profile even though I have the best average as a point point guard or a center or or have the best free throws or have as many touchdowns or I'm getting all the accolades do I do I still have a sense of humility that I don't look at others as being beneath me I cannot associate with you Even taking a low glam glamour job that benefits others more than me. That's why whenever I go into schools or go into businesses, to go into churches, I always stop and say hello to the custodians. Don't ever think you're more important than the custodian. You don't want to come to a dirty school, and you don't want to come to dusty floors. Is there anybody in this house? And you can be the administrator. You can be the system administrator. You can be whatever. But if you're coming when there is nothing clean, the, the garbage cans are empty or either full, you, you want to make sure that they know that they are part of the team. Whenever think you're better than cafeteria worker. Be kind to that person that got to fix your McDonald Big Mac. Don't get crazy. Be kind when you go to the restaurants and those the waiters, they may not serve you as, as, as frequent or as timely as you may think. And you get attitude with them. That steak may not be cooked to your taste bud. 
but don't send it back. The tea may not be as sweet as you desire to be. Make sure you be nice to them and say, can you please bring me another glass of tea? Don't get no attitude. They'll make it sweet. Got to move. Don't ever think that you're more highly than others. There is no company, no church who will not have to deal with people who expect it to be given certain offices regardless of their ability to do the job. I've seen people in churches across the country unwilling to share ministries and people wanting to lead in areas they were unqualified to lead. Let me just go ahead and serve notice what the primary qualification to lead in the body of Christ. And it's not a Ph.D. It's not an MBA. It's not an M.D. It's not an undergraduate degree. You have to have a BA. Come closer. In order to lead in the body of Christ, you can have all kinds of advanced degrees. You can have all kinds of, of undergraduate degrees, but that is not the primary qualification criteria to lead within the body of Christ. Somebody asked me, what kind of BA are you talking about, Pastor? You've got to be born again. Is there anybody in the house? If you're not born again, then you are disqualified for leadership in the body of Christ. People who were unwilling to give newcomers a chance to serve. We have to continue to pray, God, send us who you want us to have and send us what we need. And those of us who have been here for years, we have to open up our arms to receive them. The same way when you get a new player on the team, and you may be the, you may be the thing on the team. Is there anybody in this house? You may be the star on the team, but here comes a new player just relocated to the city, and yet you try and make that person feel as though they got to carry whatever you want them to carry is there anybody in this house you have to make sure that they are just as welcome as the ones that's been on the team for years those who may find themselves thanking themselves more highly than others on the team those are not team players and the companies and the church suffers as a result. It is good for us to be reminded daily of Paul's words in Philippians 2.3. You all want to know what it says? This is what it says. Do nothing from a selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Husbands, count your wives more significant. Than yourself. She's on the team. Wives, count your husbands more significant than yourselves. He's on the team. Is there anybody in this house? And yes, even your children, count them more significant. Because we have to let our children know that there's potential in their lives. There are some things that we can see they may not be able to see, but there are some things that they can also teach us. When you make a mistake, tell your children you're sorry. Is there anybody in this house? They are a member of the team. Is there anybody here? The call is always to practice humility. If your children don't see you humble, then what will happen, they'll keep thinking that they're better than somebody else. It doesn't matter what side of the track you live on. It doesn't matter what school you go to. You need to make sure that you practice a spirit of humility. And the only way that you can practice a spirit of humility, you must have first a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Is there anybody in the house? Let someone else tell you your worth and your praise. Don't puff you up. Don't hype you up. Don't brag yourself up because you may be the only one who has that opinion of you. Is there anybody in this house? 
Don't go around. See, Michael Jordan never had to brag on his game. He just stepped on the court and he says, just look at what I got. Is there anybody in the house? He didn't have to just trash talk to nobody. You, you know what? Tom Brady don't have to trash talk. Tom Brady can come back from the, from the, from the, from the biggest deficit in, 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 in football history in the Super Bowl. I knew when they put that camera on Tom Brady and he had his head between his legs. I said, don't give him another chance. Is there anybody in the house? And they decided not to run it because they wanted to go with Ryan. And you saw the, is there, Tom Brady's got five Super Bowl rings. Is there anybody in this house? Tom Brady don't have to brag about nothing. Is there anybody in the house? Shaw can win 19 whatever championships. But don't let you get so up on yourself that you start thinking that you are that good because not, make sure there are going to be some people that's going to shoot after you. But if you keep a humble attitude, then you can continue to show the good sportsmanship that champions are made of you don't have to brag on yourself let others brag about you here's number two everybody say number two the first word he says you got to be humble here's number two he says be gentle everybody say be gentle that means having an attitude that demonstrates power with reserve and gentleness another word for gentleness is meekness now, we need to understand that's not something that our president really practiced. I'm not talking about President Trump. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. I don't know President Trump. He doesn't know me. The same way I didn't know President Barack Obama, but when President Barack Obama did some things that I disagreed with, then I'll put it out there. There are some good things that President Trump may be doing, but on this one, this call that he did not make on what was happening in Charlottesville, Virginia, he missed that one. Is there anybody in this house? We have to stand when there is evil. Is there, when there is discrimination, when there is prejudice, when there is racism, we must stand and make sure that we expose it. Is there anybody in this house? So that does not continue to be perpetuated. Let me just go ahead and serve you notice. Racism still exists. I love diversity. We embrace diversity. But do you know what diversity should be also equated to? Is equality. Treat me with equality. Provide the same opportunities that others are provided. Is there anybody in the house? And we need not be afraid to talk about our differences. Cannot smooth over racism and prejudice because it's an insidious disease. Dr. King, the late Dr. Martin Luther King says we don't practice tolerance. We don't teach tolerance. Tolerance is like an insidious disease. We teach acceptance. Doesn't matter whether you're black, white, red, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter whether you're Latino. It doesn't matter whether you're Hispanic. It doesn't matter if you're from the low side of the track, the high side of the track. We practice acceptance. We accept you for who you are. We're not going to tolerate you. Be gentle. Some of you remember when Coach Don Shula first began coaching the Miami Dolphins. They were ranked at the bottom of the AFC. Before the season began, Coach Shula showed his new Dolphin team a film of the previous season championship team, the Baltimore Colts. They're known as the Indianapolis Colts now. Coach Shula told the Dolphin players to focus not on each play, but on what happened after each play. The Colts players, the Baltimore Colts players, Help each other up, high-fived one another, and shouted encouraging things to one another. But then he showed the Dolphin players film from their previous season, and these elements were missing. He challenged his players to get in the habit of encouraging one another on the field, help one another. Share care for one another because that's how 
champions play. As you probably know, Coach Don Shula went on to become the winningest coach in the history of the NFL football. And the Dolphins soon became the only team in history to post a perfect season. What's your point? My point is this. What will we do as a church, as a community, to care and to show care and concern for one another? When someone is hurting, will we let them hurt and be glad it's not us? Will we not approach them because we are uncomfortable? Will we say we're too busy and walk the other way? Will we say I never liked them anyways and walk the other way? How will we show one another what Paul talked about? Those are really true signs of deep, powerful love which we have for one another when we rejoice with one another. Yeah, we've had victories, and, but yet when we lose, will we be there for one another? When we weep, when we cry, will we be there with one another? That love needs to be present on a daily basis. Not just when our backs are against the wall. We need to offer real encouragement to one another. Young people need to know how to offer encouragement to one another. Adults need to know how to offer encouragement to one another. Not tear each other down. Not be jealous of one another. Not have a crab mentality of one another. But we are here to lift each other up. Life is a team sport. And our job is to encourage everyone on the team. When they hit a home run, when they sink a basket, or when they fumble the ball, or when they miss the last winning possible goal with two seconds left. When they strike out with the bases loaded. As Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse 11, he says, Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. We are to be humble. We are to be gentle. That's the virtues of a player with a player's spirit and attitude, a team player. Here's the third one. Not only are we to be humble, not only are we to be gentle, but here's the third one that Paul uses. He says, third, be patient. Everybody say, be patient. We are living in a very impatient society. Our children are impatient. They think things are supposed to be done by Friday. But even there are those who want God to move by Tuesday. And I just come by to tell you, come on a little closer. I'm almost finished. God don't have to do anything by Friday. Tell your neighbor, God does not have to do anything. He does not have to move by Friday. Be patient. That's the attitude that says I will not be, come on a little closer, short-tempered. But I will be long-tempered. That's the literal meaning of patience. Instead of having that short fuse, we have a long fuse. The King James uses the phrase long suffering for patience. And when we are patient, long suffering, and long tempered, it means we do not give up on anyone. It means we do not give up on anyone. Have you ever thought about how optimistic the word patient is? It implies that the final result will be good, even if the process takes long. I remember when Bray and Kevin would ask us if they could do something. And oftentimes Jack and I would say, maybe. They would always take maybe as yes. In some respects, it was our saying, be patient and you'll get it eventually. They knew it and they often were pretty happy with a maybe. 
Because that usually equaled yes. We need to be patient with one another. Because no person is a lost cause. Tell somebody no person is a lost cause. We are to keep believing in them and continue in encouraging them until they come around. They may not be able to shoot free throws like you. Work with them. They may not be able to run as fast as you. Work with them. They may not be the first or the second string. They may be third or fourth, but work with them. We are to keep believing in them and continue encouraging them until they come around. It does not matter if that is in the church, at home, at work, in school. We cannot give up on our children. May not read as good as you. Help them read better. May not know the math that you know. Help them know the math better. Don't laugh at them. Don't make fun of them. If they find themselves having failing grades on the team, don't look to put them off. But get them the tutoring that they need. Get someone on the team who's a good math student and have them tutor them. Wherever we go, we will meet people who are not very easy to deal with. Can you find something good in them? That's why your coach may get on you the way they get on you and you think your coaches may be mean, but they see something in you that you may not be able to see in yourself. They will not give up on you. And you need to understand that you don't be impatient with your coach. You don't get attitude and start, I'm going to do what I want to do. Quit the team because they see something in you that you may not be able to see in yourself. And I thank God that Jesus saw something in us. I got to go now so long. I'm glad that he saw something down through the corridors of time that, that it allowed him to leave his throne in glory come down on this earth in order to rescue us from the power of sin the penalty of sin I'm glad that he came down to make it possible for me and you to be on a winning team to develop a team player spirit and the only way that you can have a team player spirit and a team player's attitude is that you must have Christ in your life. And I'm so glad that he took it for me. Don't you know sometimes it takes a player to take it for the team, take one for the team. Jesus took one for the team over 2,000 years ago. Is there anybody in this house? Yeah, he came down through 42 generations, conceived in the womb of a virgin called Mary, went to a hill called Calvary. The devil thought he had defeated him. The devil thought he had him. But I'm so glad that Jesus was on already a winning team. I'm so glad he was on the team of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a mighty good team for him to be on. Is there anybody in the house? The second person of the Trinity came down because he loved you and I so much that he went to a cross and allowed them to put nails in his hands. The defensive team thought they had him on a cross. He allowed them to put nails in his feet. Satan's team thought they had defeated him. But I'm so glad that Jesus was on the winning team because he says if I be lifted up I'll draw some other teams to me I'll draw black white red blue green I'll draw Hispanics I'll draw whites and blacks I'll draw Mexicans I'll draw all the men unto me they lifted him high and stretched him wide the Bible says that he died between the sixth to the ninth hour huh? on that Friday. Huh? Satan team thought they had him. Huh? Is there anybody in the house? Huh? Satan says, grave, I'm going to give him to you. Huh? Death, I'm going to put him in your hand. Huh? They thought they had him. Huh? They thought they had the victory. Huh? But Jesus, huh? being Lord of Lords, huh? being God of God, huh? being mightier than 
mighty. The Bible says he locked his head in his shoulder and gave up the ghost. He went into a bar or tomb. He was on the, come on somebody, the 50 yard line. In there anybody in the house who knows what I'm talking about? On that Friday he was doing some huddling. Is there anybody in the house who knows what I'm talking about? He was on the 50 yard line on Friday. On Saturday morning he pulled the sting from death. Put him on the 30 yard line. Pulled the victory from the grave. Put him on the 2 yard line. But I'm so glad that resurrection Sunday was coming. He was going to score the touchdown because I love early. Anybody know about early? Early. Now I know y'all. Y'all say you don't take all of that. But let me ask you short girls. When you score a three pointer. What's the response of? What's the response of the team? What's the response of the school? What's the response of those spectators? When you score a touchdown. What's the response of those who score the touchdown? Well let me just show you what happens. What happens if you score a three pointer. Or if you score a touchdown everybody in the crowd start giving high five everybody in the crowd start getting cheers everybody in the crowd start saying that's go oh, that's all right but when you hear early I'm just cheering because on that Sunday morning he was raised from the dead touchdown with all power touchdown in heaven and in earth touchdown and I'm so glad a long time ago he made a touchdown for you and for me is there anybody in the house and if you truly want to be on a receiving team if you truly want to be on a winning team you must receive and believe in God through Jesus Christ is there anybody in the house who knows what I'm talking about to have the kind of players attitude to have the kind of player spirit that you need to have then you must have Jesus Christ. But can I just go ahead and close with this? I know some coaches are out there, but when I played football for Columbus High School, we ran a wishbone. I was the left halfback of the wishbone. I had coaches that were called a particular play. It was called 22 Crossbuck. And then we were in practice, and the coach would call the offense offensive back coach he said we want to run 22 cross but and then I thought I was quicker than quick I thought I was faster than a cat I thought I could cut on a dime I had a 6'9 260 pound pulling guard by the name of Mike Sebastian and it was supposed to be Mike Sebastian who was going to pull down the line the guard on the defensive team was going to get kicked out by the offensive guard. The linebacker who was 6'2", weighed around about 235. He was going to plug the hole, but 6'5", 6'9", 260 pound, Mike Sebastian. It was his assignment to kick out the offense, the defensive linebacker. The only thing I was supposed to do is to follow the block of Mike Sebastian. But I had this thought in my mind I was faster than fast quicker than quick I had been hyped up I thought I could get it on my own so the coach said run 22 cross buck and when that linebacker was sitting in the hole he was taught to watch my belly button don't watch my move don't watch my helmet don't watch my shoulder pad but look at his belly button and you will have him dead in his tracks so I ran up in the hole before Mike Sebastian got there this 6'2 235 linebacker crushed 
me. My helmet went one way. My mouthpiece went another. There was dirt all on my face. I trotted back, went back to the huddle. I thought my coach was going to call another play. I was praying that he would. My coach said, running again, 22 cross buck. And I looked at him as if he was crazy. Then he called the play again. I thought I would fake him out, but that same linebacker, I went before Mike Sebastian, got to that linebacker. The linebacker crushed me again. He looked at me like I was fresh meat. My helmet went one way. My mouthpiece went another way. I had blood running down my mouth. I went back. They handed me my helmet. They handed me my mouthpiece. I wiped the dirt from my face. I got back into the huddle and the coach said run it again. 22 cross a buck and I thank God there was another coach who pulled me aside, whispered in my ear and said Johnny, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take a stutter step. When you take a stutter step, you count 1,001, 1,002. That's going to give this 6'9", this 265-pound guard the opportunity to get to that hole. And whichever his helmet tied of the helmet is on, you go the opposite way. So I went back to the huddle. The, the quarterback called 22 cross buck. I was standing there. He said, a hub one. A uh, hut two, a uh, hut three. I took a counter step. I saw Mike Sebastian going down the line. By the time I finished my counter step, the quarterback handed me the ball. I was on the outside hip of Mike Sebastian. And by the time we had gotten to the hole, that 6'2, 235 pound linebacker met. 6'9", 265 pounds. Mike Sebastian, Mike Sebastian kicked him to the left and I went to the right. I was so happy. I ran all the way down. I got to the end zone. Touched down. I ran back. I hugged Mike Sebastian. I ran back. I hugged my coach. I ran back. I hugged my quarterback. I was so happy that I listened to the coach. I'm so glad that Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, when you follow his lead, when you follow his direction, he'll block for you. Is there anybody in here who knows he'll block for you? And I just come by to tell you, if you truly want a team player spirit, you must receive Jesus Christ. You become a part of his team. Team. And I just come by to tell you, he won in a long time ago. If you know what I'm talking about, say hallelujah. Praise his holy name. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. And I just come by to ask you the question. Do you desire to have a team player spirit. Do you desire to have a team player's attitude? Do you desire to represent a winning team? The team is headed by Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. I don't know where you're sitting. I don't know who you are. But I want to offer you the opportunity to decide to follow Christ today. You may ask me, well, how do I do that? I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not offering you to come become a member. I'm offering you to be convicted and converted and compelled by the Holy Spirit to be a disciple of Jesus the Christ, to become a part of his team. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe sincerely, genuinely in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You shall be rescued from the penalty of sin, which is eternal death. You shall be rescued from the power of sin. 
and you become a part of his winning team. And you have an opportunity.